my name is Matthias Meyer. This is me moonlighting as my, in my second job as a conference photographer as well. And that's Doug Crockford running out of the picture, just as a side note. Uh, I work for a company called Basho, who are makers of a distributed data store called Riak. And we should dive right in. Has anyone heard of Node.js? Yeah, show band, excellent. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that because it's JavaScript. But this is a Ruby conference, and we're, we're going to be talking about Ruby. But Node.js made one thing very popular uh, over the last, well, 18-ish months, uh, which is uh, evented asynchronous programming. And that's what we're going to be talking about, because Ruby has had something like that for more than five years now, and it's called Event Machine. It's basically evented I.O. for Ruby, and it's non-blocking I.O. for Ruby. We're going to be looking into good detail about what that means in a minute. Um, in a traditional I.O. workflow, like when you're talking to a network, um, you basically have stuff like you open a socket in the very literal sense. Uh, you read and write through the socket, and you wait for something to happen, for data to, get, to go out or data to come in, and you rinse and repeat. That is kind of the basic uh, construct which you usually use to uh, well, build a server in any language, basically, that is traditionally procedural in that regard. That's kind of, you could build that in C, you can build this in Ruby, whatever you fancy. But this is kind of the basic example of a single-threaded uh, server, which basically does echo, which is kind of the hello world of network servers. Um, and it can only serve one client at a time. It is pretty basic. In a, in a Rails workflow, it's pretty similar. You, get a, you have a request coming in, you, you ask the database for some data, you wait for it once again, and you run as a response. Basically, uh, it's a pretty picture. It could kind of look like this. This was the closest thing I could find to uh, how a Rails request would look like, but uh, you get the idea. Um, you do a lot of waiting. You, you wait for it, and you wait for it, and you wait for the database, you wait for data to come back from somewhere, you wait for data to be sent somewhere, and that's a lot of waiting. You could, be, you could do a lot of other things in that time while you wait for something for I.O. To, come, to go out or come in. Uh, the basic gist is that I.O. usually blocks the flow in a traditional procedural style. And you could, use, you could try and use threats for that to solve that problem. You, can, you could basically wrap every connection in a different threat. And, but kind of the problem starts to accumulate when you have 10,000 clients trying to connect to your server which gets kind of awful because then you have a, one thread for every client and thanks to Ruby's well MRI's uh, threading model, you can basically only serve one client at a time still, but at least you know all the other threads, uh, they can wait and they won't bother uh, the main workflow and they won't bother blocking any other thread that's currently doing something. So it's kind of an improvement, but you know, it's like meh, it doesn't exactly feel right. It's not, it can't really be the, the sole solution to that problem. Uh, especially not when you're looking at the C10K problem, which is kind of an article that Dan Kegel wrote like 12 years ago about servers being able to handle 10,000 co uh, client connections at one time. And when you're doing threads, that gets kind of terrible. And I'm not saying threads are terrible, it's just, it just gets a lot harder to handle. And there should be a simpler solution for that. And I highly recommend reading that article because it's from a very low level standpoint, it is kind of the introduction to everything that Event Machine and even Node.js and every other evented uh, I.O. framework is based on. So highly recommended read, and even 12 years later, still pretty sad that we still have to reference that article and talk like this. Um, but it's kind of hard to serve 10,000 clients with just simple Ruby, so why would you need evented I.O.? Because lots of things are I.O. bound. When you build applications, you know, your database is I.O. bound. Um, calling external services, I.O. bone, a lot of things. And there's usually little processing involved. The only processing you do, for example, in a web application is mostly rendering a view. That is kind of the most important part that does any, any noteworthy processing that, uh, that hawks the CPU. That is, you know, in that, and in the time you're waiting for uh, the database to come back, you could basically render the, uh, render the response for a different uh, request in the same time. So. There's room for improvement. For some examples for you know traditional for stuff that is very suitable for evented I/O and proxy soft real-time apps. Whenever you do whenever you open a web socket, you know what's behind that should in some way be evented because it's going to be terrible to scale up. 
when you use, for example, uh, a, a, a separate thread for every client connection to WebSocket. There's going to be a talk on that tomorrow, uh, and you should go to that talk to see how that works out in uh, in production. Actually, how to do how to use uh, like basically WebSocket published subscribe systems uh, using Event Machine and streaming firewalls APIs like the Twitter search API, for example, or user stream stuff like that. It would be much more convenient to have something that's just you know when when something new comes in, when a new search result comes in from a Twitter API, just you know. Whenever it comes in, just do something with it. And you know, if something, that, if nothing comes in, I don't want to bother. I'm just, I just may as well uh, use use the time to do something else. Messaging is another traditional example. If you use, uh, if you've used stuff like RabbitMQ uh, before, the standard standard Ruby driver for RabbitMQ is based on Event Machine, and it kind of makes a lot of sense. Publish subscribe systems, like you have. One client pushes uh, pushes a message out, and something on the server backend pushes uh, pushes the message to a lot of other clients, which kind of brings me back again to real time web apps. But it's kind of kind of a sort of use case of that. Um, if you only have simple APIs that you know basically just go to the database, fetch something, and uh, return it back, and may as well do something else in that time, may as well look into Evented I/O. And if you think about it, a lot of Rails apps do just that. But I'm going to go into Rails a little bit later. And the fun, the fun stuff is that you can build any kind of network server with it. Obviously, when you have a network server that does a lot of processing, it gets hard again. But you know, Event Machine is kind of nice in that regard. And I'm going to be showing some examples. The, the basic gist is something that, like Event I.O. makes a lot of sense when throughput is more important than, th than processing. When you just want to shove data from one end to another, you know, it's kind of kind of a nice fit for for Evented I/O and for Event Machine in that regard, or Node.js or whatever, what have you. Um, it's just terrible with blocking I/O, because you know, imagine a pub sub system where you have one client pushing messages out and a thousand clients pub, pub, uh, you know, subscribe to that one topic. That's a lot of threads, or a lot of processes, which is kind of the uh, which. Sadly, always has been the only uh, only known way in existence in Ruby land to scale out an application. Just fire up another process. It shouldn't be the only solution. What we really want is a Hollywood style model. You know, don't call us, we'll call you. You don't want to pull on something, you don't want to pull on a socket for data. Uh, you just, you know, you just say, say to the system, you know, whenever something comes in, just call me. You know, whenever a new job comes in, just call me. Whenever new data comes in, just let me know, and I'll do whatever. Or I'll just wait a little bit longer. The basics of your machine. How does it work? It does not work like magnets, but it's based on C++, and it's, it's, not, it's not scary at all. Just spend a lot of time in the last days browsing through the source code of Event Machine, and it's it's a decent, it's a decent code base, and you know, if you want to understand Evented I/O, I highly recommend browsing through the source yourself. You know, just get over that scary moment of C++, and just you know, it's basically it's just a lot of procedural code. So, but I wanted to figure out how even how Evented code works on the operating system level. So, it was kind of a nice opportunity to dig into the uh, code and read some C++ again, which I haven't done in a long time. Uh, event machine is based on two patterns, if you will. One is the event loop. The event loop is basically something that it's, imagine it's a while true loop. You, I'm pretty sure at some point everyone has programmed the while true loop and re realized that it runs forever. <laughs> and that's basically what event machine does as well. But you know, on every loop, event machine does a couple of things. It checks, you know, it goes to, it goes to a list of sockets. It checks all the sockets if there is like new data has come in. Uh, it can fire a bunch of timers if you set them up, and then afterwards it will just fire all the all the logic that you assign to, for example, a single network socket, and that is basically the event loop. And when you look in the code, it's actually the event loop is really just, I think it was like five lines of actual code in Event Machine that is what is called the event loop. The other pattern it's based on is the reactor pattern. It's not in the Fukushima style, uh, you'd, you'd have to think in a different direction for that. It, it's, coming for, it's not coming from nuclear power plants, but from the fact that you, know, you react to something. Whenever data, whenever you open a socket and you wait for data and the data finally comes in, you react to it. Because Event Machine tells you, hey, 
here's some new data for you, and here, do something with it. Do whatever. And that is kind of why it's called a reactor. So the basic of, of evented programming is that you go away from, from procedural programming where you get some data from a socket and you return it. Uh, you go to callbacks. And, and you know the, the closest thing to callbacks in Ruby is obviously blocks. And what you're gonna do instead of just calling a method is you, you're, gonna, you're gonna call a method, give it a block, and say, hey, here's this block, just call it whenever something comes in. You know, that is kind of, kind of comes, uh, comes out differently from what you're used to in Ruby with blocks, because usually you give, you know, you give a block to a method, and the method at some point will just execute the block in, you know, inside of its usual workflow. But here it actually means, you know, whenever, whenever fire this block, it can be, it can be 10 minutes, it can be 60 minutes, or it can be 10 milliseconds. Callbacks, mm. delicious. A lot of callbacks in your code. Um, event machine can, ar can run callbacks which contain your, you know, whatever logic you have that reacts on, uh, on data that comes in uh, on a couple of events. When a connection is established, this is specific to uh, network sockets. When you receive data from a socket, and when a connection is closed, or when a timer is fired. Timer is kind of nice because you can say, you know, in a second, just fire this block. And you can do evented I.O. for sockets, for external processes for the keyboard, because kind of old school, and stuff like file watchers. So, you know, like, when this file changes, just let me know, which is kind of nice, too. At the basic core, event machine is a single thread. Is one process and the event loop runs in one single thread. So it's like, okay, why, how is it different from your usual from your usual programming model in Ruby? You know, it's the main difference is that your code will not run procedural. Your code will run at some point in the future. So it doesn't really matter that it's single threaded, because it has one neat thing to it. You don't have to deal with threads. You can with uh, with event machine, but you don't have to. Basically, in the event loop. Um, Event machine will go ahead and run a couple of uh, I/O op operations, like send out data and fetch in new data from sockets, or check sockets if new data came in, and always one processing operation at a time, basically. You know, so that one processing operation that you have, you know, assigned to one single one server connection, you know, make it a fast one, make it really fast because that that operation will block everything else. Your your big while true loop. It will be blocked, and you don't want that loop to be blocked. So whatever processing you do, it needs to be very, very fast in event machine. I'm not saying you know it doesn't, it it can't be you know faster. It doesn't can. It, sorry, it can't be slower than 10 milliseconds. But you know it's like the, the faster you can get it, the more the more efficient your event machine loop will be. This is the event loop. It basically, it's basically not more than calling em.run and giving it a block. And whatever runs in that block will run forever until you tell it to explicitly stop or until you kill your program. Um, you can use threads in uh, an event machine, um, but if you're doing I.O., if you're sending data or if you're receiving data, it always has to be under reactor threads. Reactor thread, single. Um, We've kind of we, we've kind of seen some odd things happen in production if you do, don't do that, but you get some weird errors from event machines. So if you're doing if you're sending something uh, over the network, it always has to happen on the uh, on the reactor thread. There's a simple way to achieve that, and I'm going to show some examples of that. So let's start with the basic example of the Echo server, which is as I said, the hello world of network servers. Probably build that in your first semester at, at college. And this is how you would do that in event machine. And when you compare that to the example I showed earlier, which is kind of the traditional socket example, um, there's a lot less boilerplate code here. You don't have to explicitly open the socket. You just say event, uh, say event machine. I want to have a server on this port listening on this, this IP address. And you know, whenever some data comes in, uh, receive data is called, and I'm going to just send the data out again. So that's your basic echo server with uh, event machine. You don't get any boilerplate networking code, which is kind of nice because you can focus on callbacks again. 
You can you can focus on writing your callbacks or even better your application logic that does something with the data that comes in from event machine. Um, how do we get rid of callbacks? You can you can specify a module instead. You just you know you just put a nice uh, create a module for your echo server, which uh, has a predefined method which is called re receive data. That's kind of the the convention of event machine. This method is called whenever data comes in. And we'll just send it back. And instead of a, instead of a callback, we just uh, we just give the start server method uh, this module, and we'll just mix it in into a connection, and call this method whenever something comes in. The client, the client doesn't it looks pretty similar. We once again once again we put it in a module, and the difference here is that there is a method called post in it, which is basically the method that is called you know when the when the connection uh, has been created when the connection is set up. This is the method it's going to be called, and we're just using that moment to send our hello world out. And we're at, at some later point, receive data will be called again, and we're going to get data back. And you wrap it in EM run. An HTTP server and event machine would look like this. This is a bit of a longer example. Uh, It basically uses a little library called uh, Event Machine HTTP Server, which is uh, a C-based HTTP server. And you get some niceties on top. You don't have to parse HTTP yourself. But this is just a, a basic example of how you would do a Hello World HTTP server. Um, Event Machine supports out of the box a lot of protocols you can deal with, like for client, uh, client programming, which is HTTP, SMTP, Memcached, Redis, MySQL, Postgres. And a lot of other things. There's a bunch, a whole bunch of protocols, uh, and these all come with a default event machine, which you can basically start using to talk to Memcache to your database or whatnot. Um, let's look at some examples. For for example, how do I fetch my IP using event machine? There's a nice library called EMHTTP request from Ilya Grigoric. He's done a lot of stuff with event machine. I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be showing a couple of his libraries, and it is pretty impressive what they're doing. And this is basically to get a request from JSON IP, which would show me uh, my current, which would return my current IP as a JSON, a JSON string. And once again, you give it a callback. You can't get in, you can't have enough callbacks in Event Machine Code. Uh, so we have that IP now. We parse it. You know, we use in JSON parse, which it is uh, at the basic, is, uh, as the, at the most basic core, is processing. And then we store it in Redis. We get another callback. We can use that callback to send an email. So basically, the workflow would be, you know, fetch this data, then store it in Redis, and then send an email. And now we come up with uh, with this. Which is kind of the 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 problem with event programming that you end up with a lot of callbacks in your code, and that's kind of you could call it spaghetti code, but it's Probably not necessarily, but it's, it certainly isn't pretty. You know, you have, whenever the, uh, the command in Redis is set, you know, you get a response, and when that response comes in, you send, a, you send an email and give that another callback so that you can say to the user, okay, your email was sent. This is a stupid example, but, you know, it's like you get the basic idea of how terrible callbacks can be. And, yeah, it's, the code is full of callbacks. And here's an example of how that would look in Node.js. Look at all the curly braces. You know, I'm not hating on Node.js here. It's like, um, it's just I hate curly braces. That is all. <laughs> um, it's not that different. You know, if you, if you really compare it, it's not that much more code. It's just a lot more curly braces, so. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could just stick to our usual uh, procedural model? If we just have, you know, like, like in the old days when we just when we fetch a request and you know we wait for that we when that data comes in we return it to uh, store it in a local variable and then we we parse the the JSON that comes back, then we store it in Redis and stuff like that and all just you know in a much better readable code. Anyone heard of fibers before? Has anyone used fibers? Excellent. I can totally relate. <laughs> fibers are terrible. Um, 
the basic gist is you can't use uh, Ruby 1.8, but you know you shouldn't be using Ruby 1.8 anyway. So is there anyone still using Ruby 1.8? Yeah, you need to you need to stop doing that. <laughs> you need to use Ruby 1.9 because uh, fibers were introduced in Ruby 1.9 as a means of lightweight concurrency. And if you look back at stuff that Python had for like years ago, uh, it's at the basic core, it's either called a continuation or a coroutine. There's like, if you read Wikipedia, you get an excruciating detail how both are kind of different, but how one basically builds on the other. Um, and basically, a fiber is a means to say somewhere in your, in your program's flow, okay, I'm gonna stop here and return you know, the control of the flow to something else until you explicitly tell me that I can start working again. And it's like, I just had this, uh, this uh, eureka moment just like a week ago about how that would work with event machine. Um, hold on, uh, I'm gonna continue, sorry. Actually there, um, Xavier Shea just posted a nice article on, you know, he dug into a new library built by Ilya Gugorek and his company, and he wanted to find out how you know, they're doing this uh, synchronous programming style but still using asynchronous, um, uh, asynchronous behind, the, you know, behind the curtains using event machine. And I just looked at one code example in that code and was like, oh. yeah. And that day I finally understood fibers because <laughs> the problem with fibers is in most books you only find examples that will show you some generators and stuff like that where you, know, you have a bunch of words, you iterate, you use a fiber to iterate over them. But it's like, you know, you don't, that's why no one has used them in production yet, because, you know, when do you do that in production? When do you have to iterate over, over a set of words? When you have to iterate over a set of words, you just use an iterator. But um, the simplest fiber, uh, fiber support in Ruby 1.9 is very, very simple, and you actually need to require fiber explicitly to get the full continuation support. And I'm going to have to go through this in, in good detail. This is the EM HTTP request code using fibers. You get a current fiber, which assumes that some fiber has been configured before. We, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go into that in a minute. And you use your callbacks as, uh, still, but instead of doing your application logic in the callback, you're saying after fiber.resume and give it the request object, which is this up here. And down here, you're using fiber yield to say, okay, I'm ready, you know, I'm ready to give up control. From here on, I'm gonna be sleeping. Just let me know whenever something happens. And something will happen in one, in one of the next loops of event machine. In one of the next loops in event machine, you know, some IO will come in or an error will be raised, which is kind of this error back method. It's kind of, you know, the callback that's run on an error on a connection. And something will happen and it will wake up the fiber, basically. And the flow will, will keep continuing here and fiber yield will return the object that is given to fiber resume in the callback. So in a nice way, we just, we just got a request back. We got, a, we got the object that you know, was given to the callback, and down here we're still, we, we have nice access to the object, and we can fetch the response. And that is, we just, wrote, we just rewrote all our asynchronous evented callback code into procedural code just using fibers. If you have a question on fibers, please ask, because they're really terrible. <laughs> it took me a long time to understand that, unfortunately, but that kind of clicked with me, that example, because it's like, wow. You know, this is like, you know, like real world application of fibers, not just some <coughs> weird uh, text analysis. And to really have that full, you know, to have the full flow, you have to wrap it in a new fiber, because you never, in the Ruby process, there's always one main fiber, um, but you can't use that because it's like it's only there, you know. And you always have to create a new fiber if you want to run uh, fiber code in that in that block. And basically, you yeah, just have to that new fiber will do nothing on uh, you know when when you create it. Um, you have to call resume on it, and then it will start you know executing the block until down here until it's, uh, fiber yield is called, and then when an event comes in from the socket, you know, boom. The method returns. It is really weird, but it's kind of, together with Event Machine, it kind of so, uh, suddenly made sense to me. And once again, Ilya Gugorik built a nice library on top of that called EM Synchrony, which basically 
does all the fiber magic for you. It, all, it patches libraries like EMHTTP request or database libraries, memcache libraries, whatnot, to use fibers instead of you know, just callbacks. And so what you get is a nice bundle of, uh, of libraries, which you can use in a procedural way. You still get all the benefits from using Evented I.O., but you know, your code will look a lot nicer. But now, now you get fibers, which basically, you know, the, the easiest, the, the simplest comparison people have done with it is to call, to call them lightweight threats, because whatever stack is associated with them is a lot less than with threats, but still, you know, you're basically starting to do your own, uh, your own fiber, uh, fiber scheduling and pooling for that, if, you, <laughs> if it comes down to that. Aaron Patterson posted a nice, a nice trolling cartoon of that. You know, like, I wish I would, I would have found it because I love that one. Because it basically, in the end, it's like, oh, I'm managing my own fiber pool. Oh, no. Back at threads. So fibers are pretty insane. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I think I can find... For me, I finally understood them with the event machine. I hope it, it, I could help you understand them, but if you, did, if you didn't, if you still have questions, please see me or raise them now. Um, there's a couple of nice libraries built on top of event machine um, by companies. This one, for example, is uh, used at GitHub. It's called Proxy Machine, and it's basically a content-aware TCP router, which means you can, do, you can do something as simple as that, and those like three lines of code give you a proxy that will you know transfer all of the all of the traffic coming into a single single socket uh, to Google because you know Google wants all your data anyway. <laughs> you, you may as well set up a proxy and send it all over, but that is kind of cool. And actually, they're using that whenever you clone a repository. You know, they're using proxy machine uh, underneath to figure out you know, on which of the file servers uh, this repository is located. And it's kind of neat. They have some examples in the readme of how they're doing that, but there's kind of where the data awareness comes in because you can basically inspect you know, the traffic at a layer, at a TCP, TCP IP layer seven level. You can start, you know, if it's an HTTP proxy, you can start parsing the HTTP yourself and do something about that. But at the most basic level, you, know, you, you can use this and trend, you know, proxy all the uh, all the traffic coming into that proxy to Google, or whatever. Doesn't have to be Google; it could be Microsoft. A kind of different story about that is EM Proxy, which is once again written by Ilya Gagori. Did I mention he's done a lot of stuff with Event Machine? He's kind of been a very early adopter, and he's like he played with the fibers idea, I think, two years ago. Already, and now that Ruby one, you know, one one nine two is considered stable, it's like there's no reason you sh you shouldn't be at least playing with that kind of stuff because it's really neat. And what this proxy is doing, um, it's basically an HTTP proxy, and you know we're getting we're going a level up, a layer up in the in the TCP IP stack. And what you can use this for, this example basically starts uh, my proxy on a local uh, on a local host port eighty. And sets up two connections. One is a, one is a production. One is a staging connection. My staging connection obviously goes to Google again. Um, and what that little piece, little snippet of code does, whenever a request comes in through uh, to that port, it sends the it sends the request to both servers. And down here, it only returns the response if the if the if it's from production. I'm gonna need to let you think about uh, about that for a minute. Uh, what you can use it for is you have a staging system, you have a production system, and you can redirect your production traffic to your staging, staging system to measure any changes you've done to measure if they had any performance impact. And that's kind of nice. Like Engineer does something like that, and it's basically where I stole that example. Um, that is kind of neat because you can you can make this any kind of list of servers to send the data to, and. You have like a, an application-aware HTTP proxy. It's like you know, you, of course you can use Squid, Varnish, stuff like that. But you know, at some point it kind of makes sense to to sprinkle some logic on top that is specific to your application. And you know, it's like you're programming Ruby all day. You might as well use Ruby for that. That's kind of nice. Um, the latest example I already I already mentioned basically was uh, is called Goliath, and it's just I think it was just released about a month ago. 
and is once again written by Ilya Gugorik. Um, what it actually is, is an evented web framework. And it has somewhat of a REC API, and it uses fibers for everything. So it, you know, basically, you can only run it on Ruby 1.9.2. Um, but the nice thing about all of that is, you know, if you're used to building REC middleware or stuff like that, you know, it's basically very easy to get started with Goliath. And you know, once again, a Hello World example. It should look very familiar if you didn't if you did any REC. And this is kind of boring. You want to add fiber power. Basically, every request coming into Goliath is wrapped in its own fiber, and it already uses EM synchrony underneath. So you get all this cool stuff. Uh, you can, you know, you don't have to use callbacks in uh, in the in this uh, in your web API, and it's kind of nice. And you don't have to do anything for that because Goliath already does like the whole plumbing uh, and overhead for you. You can just you talk to your database like you used to. I don't know about you, but I find that very appealing because I hate callbacks and curly braces. And there's Tramp, which has a nice name and is an evented ORM underneath. It's like it's it's made by uh, what's what's his name. Pratik, um, you know you know who I'm talking about. Uh, he, he he started building out a, a framework called Cramp, which is um, an evented web framework again. Web frameworks, evented web frameworks are very much in style right now, and Tramp kind of turned out to be the evented um, ORM version of that. And you basically you know you, it looks very similar to your active record code, and but instead. Instead of having like a, an asynchronous flow, you're using callbacks again. You know, whenever you call save, you get a status object and you can check on that status object and then do other things, assign more callbacks, and you come out with a lot of callbacks. This is just an example, you know, cramp. Unfortunately, it's hard to set up. It doesn't work very well, well out of the box, but it's, you know, more an example. There's been a lot of experimentation with event machine and, you know, li building libraries on top of that, but Next to no awareness, you know, of, of event machine. Has anyone actually used event machine in production? Excellent, excellent. There should be more hands for that because it's kind of you know, what the Node.js community is is enjoying right now. We've been having that for a long time, and it's been in stable production use for a couple of years as well. You know, PostRank Goliath has been in use for more than a year now at PostRank. And it's like Goliath is pushing a lot of traffic through uh, for post rank. So it's, I can only recommend starting to look into Event Machine because it's kind of, even reading the C++ code, because it's kind of, it's kind of a to total brain twist on the one hand, and, but you can also do some nice things with it. But you know, obviously it will take you away from a usual Rails uh, or whatever, you, whatever awesome, uh, awesome things you do in Ruby. But you know, it's like, it's a cool library. It can hurt your brain a lot. But you should definitely play with it. So the the begging question: How do I run Rails on an event machine? You know, this is my usual Rails workflow, and you know, if we sprinkle an uh, event machine on top, this is how it looks like. Once again, Ilya Gugorik. This talk should actually have been about Ilya Gugorik. Um, uh, once again, he has made a, a really tiny patch for, for, a, for a, like, you can apply to a Rails project, and it will use evented libraries instead, and uh, EM synchrony once again, which uh, he did for Rails uh, 3.0, and Mike Perham did the same uh, for Rails 2.3. And you know, you have, uh, Mike Perham wrote this nice library called Rec Fiber Pool, which basically, you know, when a REC request comes in, it, you know, it creates a pool of fibers and wraps each request in, in one of the fibers from that pool. So basically, you know, you can put that REC middleware before anything else in Rails, and every Rails request will be wrapped in, uh, in a fiber. And boom, you can suddenly start doing your, you can keep, you know, you can keep doing your synchronous pro uh, pro programming, but you can use Event Machine underneath. I already talked about a couple of things in Event Machine, uh, uh, especially timers. You can say to Event Machine, here's a little block, 
and fire that off in, in about one second. It will never be exactly one second because you know if something blocks the event loop, how will you know it's going to be exactly one second? But you know it's kind of the an approximation of when, of when that block will run. You can do the same thing with a periodic timer. You can say you know fire this block every one second. And we've been using that extensively for for a while, and it's really a nice feature because it's like you just don't have to care about you know looping and checking time again. It's just like okay, you know, whenever that second is up, even when it's you know more than a second, just fire this block. Some more brain twist. Um, I talk about blocking the event loop a lot because you don't want to block the event loop. You want to keep your stuff short and you want to say, maybe you know, if you have something longer running, you want to split it up across several loops in your giant while true loop. You know? And that's what, kind of what next tick is for. Next tick basically says, take this block and run it on the next iteration of the event loop. You know, when that loop is done, when that, when that iteration is done, you know, when it starts off again, just run this block. Basically, when you have a really long iteration over uh, some, you know, a list of items, and you want to you want to do some processing on them, but you don't want to fully block the re, uh, the event loop for one go, this is kind of how you could split up that request. And more code, yay! Basically, what we're doing here is, um, and here it kind of kind of gets into callback recursion, which is oh, it's beautiful. Um, we're looping, yeah, we, we're doing a pretty useless loop. Um, like from from zero to one hundred, and you know, ev for every step, we're just scheduling the next loop on the next ev uh, event loop run. So this will basically, when that when that iterate when that stuff is done, the event loop will have fired a uh, hundred times, and on each time, this block will have been run. And whenever we haven't reached one hundred, we, we just reschedule the block for the next tick. And that is kind of a very simple and stupid example, but it's kind of the basic gist of how you split up things in event machine or in event programming to not block your event loop. I said you can use uh, threads in event machine, and you know this event machine runs on a single thread, but there's uh, certainly situations where you still want to run threads. We've been doing that for you know, for a while. Some, in some cases, it was the wrong way of doing it, but still, uh, Event Machine keeps a, a pool of threads available, which you can just uh, throw any, uh, any code at. And, you know, a basic example is sleep, because, you know, everyone loves putting sleep in their code. Uh, we want to sleep for five seconds. Um, in a traditional way, if we were just to run sleep five, you know, in the, in the EM run loop, it would block the reactor. Nothing would run with the, in these five seconds. Everything would be blocked because you can only run one piece of code at, at the same time. You cannot check, Event Machine cannot check sockets or file descriptors for new data because you were clever, to, you were clever enough to run Sleep 5 to block it. What we're doing here instead is using, to, is using em.defer to put this piece of code in a different thread. And sleep always puts the current current threat to sleep, but not the whole Ruby uh, Ruby VM. So this sleep will not block the the uh, the main event loop, which is kind of represented by this uh, periodic timer up here. You know, when you run this ping, will always pop up every second or so. If you don't do that, you just have you know a long sleep, and then you have done, but nothing in between. So at defer is kind of you can still use Ruby threads. Um, which still kind of makes sense in a way, because when you have, when you have libraries that still use uh, blocking I.O., you can just put them in a different thread. Because depending on the library that's underneath, um, the thread will not necessarily block the whole, the whole Ruby VM. It will just, you know, wait, when, when it waits for I.O., it will just go to sleep unless it will let something else run. So you can combine next tick and defer to do funky stuff. Um, you know, from the next tick, you schedule, so you schedule something to run in a different thread. And this, this piece of code down here will be run in one of the threads in Event Machine the Thread Pool. And I said earlier that you have to be sure that I.O. always comes back on the, uh, on the reactor thread. And, you know, to do that, you're just using next tick again. Well, because next tick will, be, will make sure that that block will be run on the, re on the event loop thread, on the reactor thread. 
So you can do some kind of ping pong between threads and the event loop uh, using next tick and defer. But you know, it's like, if you can avoid using threads altogether and focus on, focus on the event loop itself. But it's certainly possible to do that and there are certainly situations where it, it's feasible to do. But obviously the caveat in Ruby is always, you know, only one thread can run. Even in Ruby 1.9, you still have the, inf the infamous global interpreter lock, uh, but at least you get thread scheduling at the operating system level. Event Machine has some basic queues, which is not to compare with RabbitMQ, for example, for with a full distributed queue. You can just put stuff in and say, just run this code whenever someone else pops, it, pops something back in again. And this, there can be many, many, many event loop iterations in the future. Um, So basically when I push something in here, down here, at the next event loop, this block will be run again. And the important thing to know about is that these queues always pop once. And you just want to reschedule the pop. Again, within, uh, with the nested, nested callbacks, which is kind of nice, because the nested callbacks always hurt the brain. When would you use something like that? It's like, you know, you only have one thread, why would you communicate through something like that? And it's like, you know, like, for example, you have logging that you want to kind of be deferred. You know, you, you use a queue to push all your, log, uh, all your log lines in, and at some point, something will come, pop all the logs from that queue, and put it into a log file. One example. The other one is, of course, you know, example, tracking, tracking statistics, something like that. But logging was really the best example I could come up with, and where it would be really useful to have a queue. But you know, there's, there's an extension of queues in Event Machine called a channel, where you can basically do like publish subscribe models, uh, which is kind of weird if you think about it because you only have one thread. Why would I want to use that? But that's why Event Machine is a very nice playground because it's like, okay, what, what am I doing with all this stuff? And kind of fun. Um, I've been talking about low level IO a lot and this is kind of where I'm getting into that little uh, detail a little bit more. Um, at the very core, on every iteration, Event Machine uses a select a system call to check a list of file descriptors for new changes. And that only scales up until, well, it's known to work until 1,025 uh, sockets, but it's known to break in a lot earlier than that. So at some point, which is again mentioned in the uh, C10K paper, uh, for Linux, uh, ePol was developed, where you can just say, okay, here's my list of, of file descriptors, and I'm w willing to wait for 100 milliseconds for something to come in on each of these file descriptors. If nothing comes in, just you know, forget it, and I'm just gonna run my next event loop. That is kind of the Linux version, and it scales a, a lot better than using the default select. And you basically, to use it, you just call em.epol. Or if you're running macOS 10 or any BSD system, you use KQ, which is kind of the equivalent in the BSD world to ePol. There's always caveats involved, uh, other than callbacks. Um, don't block the event loop. Whatever you do, don't block the event loop. Make your processing fast and let the event loop just flow. If you have something that needs to be longer running, push it out into some other backend that is not you know, doing the main work in the, in the event loop. Just push it out to rescue, RabbitMQ, whatever, but don't block the event loop. Because callbacks run until finished, and you want to make them fast. Oh. And again, avoid blocking code in the event loop. And with this blocking code, I mean, um, <laughs> yes. Avoid blocking code in the event loop because it blocks the event loop. Uh, what I'm going to say with that is stop using the Ruby default libraries for any, any kind of network I.O. Instead of net HTTP, you're using EM HTTP requests, for example. That is the gist of that. So, and the last question is, do I, should I, shouldn't I always run Rails on Event Machine because Event Machine is so, such an awesome sauce for scaling? And you know, the, the answer always is yes and no. Uh, it depends, because processing kills the event loop. And still, you know, Rails, depending on what your Rails application does, if it only has fast and short requests, you can certainly try doing that. And you know, you may, as you may, it's very likely that you get a benefit out of that. But you know, if your, if your view rendering takes too long, 
You know, the all the requests in Event Machine will just pile up. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm almost done. Processing kills the event loop. You can, you know, it's. I would certainly advise you to play with stuff, you know, that Mike Perham and Ilya Gugorik did to put uh, Rails into into a fiber event machine style stuff. But you know, it depends on your application if it's actually feasible, because a surprising amount of time is 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 spent in your Rails views, and not in the database. And unfortunately, can you can't do that asynchronously. It's a lot harder to, to debug. Everything that happens will happen at some point in the future. And you know, you just don't have a stack anymore. <laughs> there, is a, there will be no stack, only some weird stack trays that will just lead you somewhere in an event machine. And it's, it's a lot harder to find, to find problems and to handle errors in that regard. Because it happened at some point later, and you know, just raising an exception is just not an option. Because you know, where, is it, where is it raised to? It's just, who handles it? I don't have a, a, a proper recipe for that because it's, it's really hard to handle errors because it, at some point you may as well run into some low level event machine stuff and that's not pretty. But you know, the event machine community is very helpful in that regard and so if you run into something, uh, just ask them because yeah. Event machine is not a scaling silver bullet. Event at IO certainly makes a lot of sense in a lot of areas, but you know, just by using it, don't expect to, to scale up a lot better. So, you know, if if your Rails application works fine, there's no reason to look in event machine probably. But you know, if the geek in you is inspired to look into something else, um, look at event machine. But don't expect it to magically solve your scaling problems for you. It certainly won't do that. It is not scaling bacon. Don't block the event loop. <laughs> as, a, as a final note, to maybe give an inspiration, Erling does all of that. Erling does all of that out of the box for you. You, have, you don't need to do fibers, you don't need to do anything else, and it will scale that stuff much better over multiple cores. Because in an event machine, you can only use one process unless you fire up multiple processes, and then you start uh, solving the problem of inter-process communication again. Erlang, I would highly recommend looking in how Erlang does the event loop thing across multiple threads because it's kind of, you get the procedural programming style in a certain way and you know when you do an HTTP request for example on Erlang it will just, you know, the procedure that does that, you know, it's like it will be put to sleep and called, called again when some, uh, you know, when the data returns and that kind of sounds familiar uh, in, in the event machine style. But Erlang does all of this out of the box, and it's kind of nice. It looks a bit weird, but it's certainly the next inspiration I should give you for you know for event, how how evented I/O could be solved in the real world because Erlang is very is known to be functional to solve the C10K problem easily out of the box, and it's Erlang is awesome scaling sauce. <laughs>